Hello, I'm Saifuddin Amos. Welcome to the Bitcoin Standard Podcast, bringing you seminars from saifuddin.com, my online learning and publishing platform, where you can be the first to read my work and take my online courses on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Members can read the draft of my next book, The Fiat Standard, in full, and also receive chapters from my forthcoming textbook, Principles of Economics, as they are written. By joining saifuddin.com, you can also join our regular seminars, which you hear on this podcast. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by BitMEX Spot, the new Bitcoin spot exchange coming very soon from BitMEX. Most of you have heard about BitMEX, one of the biggest Bitcoin companies, which has been at the forefront of Bitcoin growth over the years and did a lot to help Bitcoin emerge victorious and immutable from the hard fork wars of 2015 to 2017, probably the biggest threat to Bitcoin to date. BitMEX are now rolling out new products and services, including a spot exchange and an online learning academy. And I'm very excited to be working with their new academy to prepare an introductory course on the economics of Bitcoin, utilizing top multimedia resources, which will be made available for free online for the world to learn about Bitcoin. After having spoken to the BitMEX team about what's in store, I'm very impressed by all of the things that are coming for their users. There are a lot of new products in the pipeline and a lot of momentum for the team. Keep an eye on them. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coin or friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning everyday spare change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Maxime Bernier, the leader and founder of the People's Party of Canada. Maxime is a well-known advocate of freedom and personal responsibility. He is committed to reducing the size of government, and he is known as Canada's Ron Paul. Um, it's a pleasure to be talking to Maxime. He's uh, shown some interest in Bitcoin, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, his opinions. And he's uh, somebody who's got a very unique perspective on Canadian politics. It's not very common that you find Canadian politicians uh, oppose some of the uh, draconian measures that the Canadian government has been uh, doing over the past uh, few years in terms of the economic policies, the monetary policies, as well as the uh, public health policies that um, have uh, taken off over the last few years. So it is a pleasure to have you here, Maxime. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be with you. Great. Thank you. So, um, as a starter, could you give us a little bit of a background about uh, your own personal background, how you, what did you do before politics, why you got into politics, and what made you such a staunch uh, freedom advocate? Uh, <clears throat> first, thank you for asking. Uh, yes, you know, I'm not a career politician. Uh, you know, I worked in the private sector before being in politics. Actually, I jumped into politics uh, in 2006 at 42 years old. So what I did before that, <clears throat> you know, I have a law degree uh, and I worked also in the financial sector. Um, I worked with, I uh, was VP of an insurance corporation and I was also a VP of a, a bank in Montreal. So <clears throat> my uh, career before politics was uh, mostly in the financial sector in Montreal. And I decided to um, be a politician <laughs> when I had a meeting with Stephen Harper at the summer of 20, uh, two, 2005. Uh, at that time, the liberal government in Canada uh, had a minority government and, um, <clears throat> and Stephen Harper was looking to be ready for the next uh, general election uh, and he was looking for candidates and also for some ideas. And I had a dinner with him in Montreal at the summer 2005, and we had a discussion about his platform. And I said, you know, if you want to have support in Quebec, because I'm coming from Quebec, 
And if you want to have some support, you need to lower taxes to Quebecers and everybody. You need also to respect our constitution, not interfering in provincial jurisdiction like the <clears throat> federal liberal government uh, did and is doing right now. And, uh, you know, less regulation. So I believe that he, he liked it and uh, he asked me to run. So in 2006, I decided to run in the riding of Bose <clears throat> near Quebec City. I was elected in 2006. I was uh, industry minister after that, foreign affairs minister uh, after that, uh, minister of state for agriculture and small businesses. And in 2015, uh, <clears throat> when we, we, I was a conservative at that time, and uh, when the conservative uh, government didn't win the election in 2015, uh, Harper resigned and uh, the, the job was open. So the Conservative Party of Canada had a, a contest for the leadership. And I was uh, one of the candidates. I think at that time we were about eight or nine candidates. And I didn't win with 49% of the vote. Uh, we had a very strong platform, like you said before, based on the four principles, individual freedom, personal responsibility, respect, and fairness. And all our policies were, in, were based on these uh, uh, principles. So it was a real free market conservative uh, platform. And when I didn't win, I tried to work for 13 months with the, the new leader, uh, Andrew Scheer and the establishment of the Conservative Party of Canada. They told me that uh, my ideas were very popular with the membership because I didn't win with 49% of the vote, but they won't take any of these uh, ideas for the next general election. And they were right. In 2019, you know, they didn't run on a conservative platform. So when they told me that, I said, you know, what is the point to stay with a party and run with a party when, uh, you know, they are not conservative? And I said, and I resigned, and I said that the Conservative Party is morally and intellectually corrupt. And I'm leaving that party. And we created in 2018 the People's Party of Canada. Uh, we had our first election in 2019. We had 1.6% of the vote. The second election for us was last uh, fall in 2021 on September. And we had 5% of the vote. And so this uh, party is going right now. And the platform of our party is uh, almost the same that I had when I was running for the Conservative Party of Canada for the leadership and with the same four principles. So, <clears throat> um, and now we're supposed to be around 10% uh, in the polls. And I believe that the next uh, general election in Canada may be in two or three years and the People's Party would be ready. We will have a candidate in every riding, and uh, I believe that will increase again our percentage of the vote. And I believe at that time we'll be able to elect a couple of candidates uh, in parliament. Very nice. So, um, first of all, I mean, what what do you think is the reason that the Conservative Party has moved away from this agenda of um, what? I, I think is is quite popular amongst the conservative base, uh, which is you know um, small government, um, reduced government spending. Um, realistically, uh, if you look at Canadian politics as well as uh, British politics, U.S. politics, a lot of conservative parties generally pay lip service for this, but uh, they end up uh, they you know when they when they get into power, well, they end up being very indistinguishable from other parties and i think it's uh, it's uh, f for an outsider it's not entirely unreasonable to not see these kind of things in these uh, supposedly conservative parties in in fact if you look at it from a liberty perspective um, conservative parties might not be that uh, different in fact uh, with their, um, you know, they can be less liberty-minded when it comes to social conservative, social issues, and with foreign policy, where they are very keen on foreign intervention, usually. Why do you think the conservative parties in Canada and in um, most of the Western world choose this track rather than, um, you know, more of a libertarian agenda? I believe because they don't, they don't do uh, politics uh, based on principles and convictions. Uh, you know, they're doing politics based on survey, polling, focus group, uh, because their only goal is to be in government. Their only goal is to be in power. 
So they don't want to speak about something that is not popular, like, you know, <coughs> cutting spending. Uh, when we are living in a socialist era right now, when the population is asking always for more and more spending. And, and you know, it's not uh, popular to say that. So they're not running usually on a real conservative platform because their goal is to be in government. And if they win, <coughs> they don't have the mandate to do these uh, changes. And uh, so they will do polling and try to uh, please everybody. Uh, so <clears throat> that's why, you know, I said we are running on the same platform. The platform that uh, we ran on at the last general election was the same one at the first general election for us in 2019. And it will be the same one at the next general election. We don't do a new platform uh, for every election. Uh, we believe that, you know, our ideas are the best for the country. And we need to explain that to the population. And we believe that the more we speak about what we believe, the more support we will have. So that's the opposite. Uh, and usually uh, another party will speak about something when they're going to see in the polls that they have maybe 40% of the population on that side. So maybe they will speak about a policy and help, uh, hoping that that this uh, percentage will increase. But if there's only 10% of the population on one side, they won't speak about that. And we will because we know that <clears throat> what we want to do, it's a smaller government in Ottawa that will respect the constitution, respect taxpayers, respect our individual freedom and personal responsibility. And I believe that these principles that are the foundation of the Western civilization are the best one. So a traditional establishment political party uh, won't do that. They will do polling, like I said, and speak about what is popular. And so that's why I said that in Canada here, the Conservative Party is morally and intellectually corrupt because they are giving more credibility to the uh, uh, leftist ideology uh, speaking, uh, speaking like them. So that's why we must fight there that and that's what we are doing at the people's party yeah so i in in uh, the last election you got something around five percent of the vote and the previous one you got 1.6 is this encouraging for you you think uh, the growth is encouraging do you think you're going to be doing better or are you disappointed at five percent what do you think no it's encouraging because i said to our candidates before the last general election that our goal was to have four percent why four percent because at 4%, first of all, uh, as a leader, I will be able to participate in the national debates on TV at the next general election. So at the last election, I was not part of the national debates. Uh, the conservatives, the NDP, the liberals uh, were debating together. The leaders were debating together, but I was not there. So the condition that they imposed to me was to have 4%. And at 4% also, that was important because half of our expenses as a political party uh, will be reimbursed by the government. So you need to have at least 4% for that. So that's why I said to my team, we need to have at least 4%. And now we achieved 5%. And at the next election, I will be part of these national debates. I will be able to reach to these uh, Canadians that are only listening their news on the traditional and mainstream media and not on social media. I will be able to reach to more people and half of our expenses will be reimbursed. So I believe that we did well. So what will be the goal for the next election? You know, always to increase our percentage of the vote. And for me as the leader and other candidates uh, will try to be elected uh, in parliament. Yes, well, we wish you best of luck. Um, now, uh, since 2015, since the election of Justin Trudeau, I think Canadian politics has uh, taken a decided turn toward uh, more government control and intervention in the economy. What are your impressions of this? I obviously know you have very strong opinions of this, but how do you rate the past seven years of uh, uh, Justin Trudeau rule in Canada? Well, for, for a, a guy that is fighting for individual freedom and personal responsibility, that was a disaster. Uh, that was a disaster in Canada, but also in other countries with the COVID-19 hysteria all over the globe. 
And, and you're right when you said in the beginning that um, I was the only national leader uh, in Canada that was fighting to end these uh, draconian measures uh, since the beginning of all that. Uh, 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 the last uh, two years, I did rallies and meet with people and speeches uh, against that, you know. Um, and we had a huge uh, uh, curfew, uh, stay-at-home orders, and and, uh, and also a vaccine passport that um, was imposed and still imposed in Canada. I still cannot travel uh, in Canada by plane or by train. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a prisoner in my own country. I cannot travel by plane outside the country. So, so we still have some uh, draconian measures in force right now. And so with the, the COVID hysteria and all the spending coming from uh, the federal government uh, and the, the huge deficit that they did for the last two years, it was more than $400 billion that we are paying right now for that with, uh, you know, uh, the inflation tax. So the way, the way that I'm judging the, uh, Trudeau, uh, the Trudeau government uh, uh, you know, was a disaster for, uh, for freedom, was a disaster for Canadians. Um, we may be in recession in Canada. Uh, we have inflation of 5.7%. That will go up. And inflation is a hidden tax. Uh, you know, instead of taxing us and taking uh, our money in our pockets, the government decided to have a huge deficit uh, monetized by the Bank of Canada. Bank, the Bank of Canada printed money to pay for that deficit to buy Canadian bonds. And when you have uh, more money chasing fewer goods, you have inflation. And that's what we have in this country. And so with the same dollar that you have in your pocket, you cannot buy the same amount of goods and services with that. So that's why, you know, it's a hidden tax. The government is telling you, you can keep your money but you won't be able to uh, buy everything that you want with that dollar like you were able before the inflation. Yeah, I think um, if you look at uh, Canadian money supply statistics over the last couple of years, it's actually astounding how quickly things have gone up. And, um, you know, it's uh, the fact that inflation has only, I mean, price inflation seems like it is relatively tame in government statistics you know currently it says 5.7 percent um what, what are your thoughts on that number well you know you're right that's the official rate of inflation and if you look in the u.s the official inflation uh, is about 7.8 percent something like that but if you if you take the whole formula the way that the government in the U.S. Uh, was calculating inflation uh, in the 90s, 1980s, and 1990s, if you take that formula, the inflation in U.S., it's about 15%. So uh, governments <laughs> don't like inflation, and they, they change the formula to calculate inflation. And so that's why some economists in the U.S. are saying the real inflation is 15%, nor, not 7.8%. And I believe that it must be the same in this country, in Canada, the real inflation rate. And when you, you speak to, uh, to people, they know they do, they do their grocery, it's more than 5.1%. They go for uh, the gas pump, it's more than 5.7%. Uh, so the real inflation in Canada I agree that it must be a, a lot more than 5.7%, maybe around 10%. Um, and, but that number will increase because the federal government is still spend, spending money that we don't have. And not only that government, but uh, you know, Western uh, governments uh, did the same thing the last two years. Yeah, it's one of our uh, recurring topics on this podcast, uh, how there's a big disconnect between official statistics on inflation and the inflation that people feel. And the, res the reason is very simple. Um, government bureaucrats decide what to put in the basket of goods, and they decide you know, to prioritize the kind of things whose prices don't rise a lot. 
particularly industrial goods, particularly industrial food. So they won't put a lot of weight on beef. They'll put a lot more weight on um, sugary snacks and uh, beans and lentils and things that can be produced at scale um, for whom the, 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 where production can respond to increases in supply, in demand, uh, relatively effectively in bringing the price down. And so I think um, inflation statistics are massively uh, uh, underreporting, and uh, just recently, in fact, I found out that in India, the way that they have managed to successfully fight inflation is that the central bank is still including VCRs and uh, cassette tapes in the basket of goods. <laughs> and so, as you can imagine, the price of VCRs is going down, and so the Indian central bank has been quite successful at keeping inflation at bay with that policy. And um, you know, the, the, this. Uh, the same kind of thing used to happen in the 1970s in the U.S. Um, you know, we don't hear much about what's going on behind the scenes now in the U.S. and in Canada, but we hear about what happened in the 70s. You know, people retire and then they write their books. Um, Arthur Burns, who was the chief of the uh, Federal Reserve at that time, basically got rid of about 70% of the um, goods that were in the basket of goods um, during the, during his reign. And then he kept only the 30% that weren't going up much. And that's how they managed to keep inflation down. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You, you cannot, you cannot trust the bureaucrats. And so, uh, and politicians also, I like to say that, you know, I'm, I'm not an establishment politician. I, I'm not a career politician. I can, you know, if I don't win, I'll, I'll go back in the private sector and do what I did before. Uh, I'm there to fight for these ideas. And that's why I'm patient also as a politician. I know that I won't be prime minister after the next general election, but it's, uh, it, we, we need to do an ideological revolution. And uh, that can take time. And we are ready for that. But you're absolutely right. I believe they did the same thing here in Canada and they were playing with the, the basket of uh, goods and services that they put in the formula for inflation. I'm pretty sure also. Yeah, and I think this is really the kind of uh, the depressing thing is that the, these, uh, you know, being in power allows you to use the tools of power to keep yourself in power. And so, um, you know, the, uh, the it allows you to fiddle with inflation statistics. It allows you to abuse the Constitution in order to uh, impose COVID restrictions, which essentially, I think, you know, the, the, a very important part of them is that they end up punishing people who are not uh, obedient to the government. I think, um, you know, I, I, I doubt that Justin Trudeau is so concerned about issues of public health, and I doubt that he's really, um, you know, looked at all of the scientific evidence for all of the insane draconian uh, restrictions that he placed on people. I think the reason that politicians all over the world were so anxious to do this, you know, the same politicians who tell you to eat junk food, the same politicians who subsidize the manufacturers of junk food, suddenly became extremely concerned about your health when it came down to these draconian measures all over the world. I think it's much more about politics and power and control. You're right. I'll give you an example here in Quebec, uh, in the province of Quebec. <clears throat> the premier of Quebec, you know, we're not in an emergency uh, anymore, but we are still under the Emergency Act in Quebec. And the premier said, you know, I need to pass a new legislation. Uh, and that new legislation, I will take some of these powers that I had under the Emergency Act because it can be useful. So what he's saying to the population, he says, there's no emergency anymore, but I will take some powers that the Emergency Act is giving me because you know I need that for a near future. So they really enjoyed the power that they had and they want always more and more. Yep, if there's one thing that uh, people in power like, it is more power. So what are your thoughts about, I mean, obviously, I, uh, um, uh, it's, it's clear what you thought of these measures, and, uh, but what do you think about the recent protests by Canadian truckers? What were your uh, ideas about um, you know, the protests themselves and then the reaction to them? Uh, first, I must say that um, that happened because after two years, and we had a couple of uh, protests and, uh, across the country, and I was part of that. Uh, but after two years, the population were saying enough is enough. There's no emergency anymore. And when Justin Trudeau said to these truckers, 
to cross the border uh, from U.S. to Canada, you will need to be double, uh, <coughs> double jabs. You will need to have your vaccine passport. And if you don't have your vaccine passport, you will have to quarantine for 10 days. So you won't be able to work for 10 days. And, uh, you know, I believe that about only 20% of these truckers uh, were not uh, vaccinated, but everybody decided enough is enough. And, and, and that was a kind of a grassroots movement because that was not based on logic. That was not based on science because don't forget these truckers <laughs> were, you know, essential workers in the beginning of the pandemic because they were the only one that were able to cross the border from the U.S. to Canada or Canada to the U.S. to bring us uh, foods and goods. And at that time, we didn't have any uh, vaccine and they were able. And, <clears throat> and that we had the lockdown in Canada and in some states in the U.S., but they were able to work. They were essential workers. And now, and usually when you're a trucker, you're alone in your truck. And so you cannot put the, the life of other Canadians in danger. So that was not based on logic. That was not based on common sense. That was not based on science. And they said, you know, enough is enough. And the population agreed with that. And so I was in Ottawa the, the, the three weekends. And that was a kind of a celebration. And not, not a, so a protest, a kind of celebration because people knew <clears throat> that the end uh, was coming and, and they knew that they were right. So, uh, so, so they gave us a lot of hope. And actually, a couple of days after that, provinces in Canada started to, uh, <clears throat> uh, started to end their draconian uh, measures. And so now we just have... Uh, uh, we just have uh, some measures that are still in force uh, that the federal government is still imposing. So that was a success. And I want to thank them. They had the courage of their conviction. Yeah, I think it was uh, pretty impressive to watch this. And yes, you're absolutely correct. It's clear that the thing was really about um, control and obedience, because as you said, these people spend 18 hours in a truck um, not interacting with anybody, the idea that they're going to infect anybody, and most of them are vaccinated anyway. And the you know the, the the disease had lost its severity, and people were doing uh, you know people who were getting it over the last several months were um, most of them were not having any serious complications. I mean, it was always like this, but it's just keep getting less and less serious. But I guess it's uh, it's it, what was most telling for me was the reaction of the Canadian government to this in terms of the confiscation of the bank accounts uh, of these Canadian uh, um, uh, citizens who really did nothing illegal. And I think the prosecution of people who donated to a cause that was perfectly legal was... Um, astonishing and I'm wondering if you think that uh, these kind of measures are going to be coming to opposition politicians like yourself um, at some point <laughs> everybody everybody is at risk uh, actually what they did uh, you know uh, when they frozen bank accounts of not only the organizers of that uh, freedom convoy uh, but on uh, ordinary Canadians that donate 20 bucks to that uh, convoy uh, that was, you know, without a court order, we must say that. Um, and, and they did it. Uh, actually, they did it for about 10 days. Uh, and, uh, but that was, that was too much. And I think that's, that was the beginning of something. Uh, you know, people are starting to uh, lose uh, confidence in the banking system when you're doing that. Uh, and, and actually, if you take the international example of that, was the, um, the um, repercussion and, and what the, the Biden government and other government did to Russia by uh, uh, frozen uh, the account of their central bank outside of Russia. That's about the same thing. So put these two together and, and that's not good for the financial system uh, and for the confidence of people in that system. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we will see what will happen in the near future about that. But uh, that was too much. 
And, and it's very, very sad that we were and we all, we are right now still the only national political party in Canada that uh, was speaking against that and supporting the truckers. Yes, um, but that brings us very nicely to the punchline of this whole uh, discussion, which I've been leading to. I think, uh, you know, um, first of all, this thinking about the political uh, restraints on government, I think it's very clear that uh, they're not very effective. Um, the government has shown that they can um, um, uh, that they can sidestep the constitution and do whatever they want. We've seen the political measures that they'll take. And now we're seeing it in financial terms, and I think this is really important. It's both in inflation and in confiscating bank accounts. And if only we had some kind of technology for financial uh, assets that was outside of the control of governments. Oh, wait, we do. Bitcoin. So I'm, um, um, I guess, you know, why, what do you think of Bitcoin? Um, do you see the opportunity here for it? to solve a lot of these problems? And do you see the potential really for why, um, you know, I think, I'd, I'd be perfectly honest with you, I mean, a lot of us Bitcoiners are completely disillusioned with the political process because um, you're effectively playing a game against a team um, and the referee, and the referee is wearing the jersey of the other team. So when the government is in charge of um, the, the, the financial system, it's like the, the, your opposition team has the referee. It doesn't matter how well you play if the referee is playing for the other side. You know, they take your bank account, they take your money. They're using inflation to confiscate your wealth in order to finance their operation and in order to buy votes for them and in order to win more people. And in order to really, I think, you know, they, they might not think of it this way, but politically, this is how it works. The worse off you make the economy, the more lives uh, you destroy financially, the more people are dependent on the government and the more people will vote for more draconian um, political and economic control. And um, it seems to be a winning formula, unfortunately. And um, I think there is a strong case to be made that the answer can't come from within politics, or at least if it is going to come from within politics, it's going to need. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a, it's it's a job that requires a very very new kind of tool. This is you know how in Superman they say this is a job for Superman. This is a job for Bitcoin. I think. What do you think? <laughs> I think you, you are right about that. Uh, you know, it's all because of a fiat uh, currency, fiat money. And uh, that's not new in the world. Uh, but, uh, you know, in the 19th century, we had a kind of a gold uh, standard. And, you know, I like Bitcoin. I like because uh, they're a competition. Uh, they're a competition to fiat money. Uh, and, and, you know, we as a political party, we have a policy and we said, you know, the government must not regulate uh, transactions and bitcoins and it must be free. Uh, my fear is that, you know, com government <laughs> don't like competition and, um, and they may uh, they, uh, regulate and it, will be, it can be a day harder for Canadians or for anybody to do a transaction uh, with bitcoins, but I, I, I hope it won't. Uh, and so that's why you're right saying that, you know, the financial uh, monetary system right now, we are at a turn on point like we were in the, after the Second World War, uh, after the 1971 when the Nixon closed the gold window, and <clears throat> 1974 when Henry Kissinger's uh, decided and the and, and the American government to have an agreement with uh, Saudi Arabia uh, for them to use the U.S. dollar for all their transactions uh, for oil, and that was the beginning of the petrodollars. So now, with uh, you know uh, some governments in Canada and other countries, they pass a legislation for a bail-in if we have a financial crisis not a bail out, a bail in means that, you know, if you have money in a bank and that bank is in bankruptcy, uh, the bank will decide that maybe a part of your deposit will be exchanged with um, uh, 
share of uh, of a bank that is uh, bankrupt. And so that's the bail-in. And we had that possibility in Canada. The federal government passed the law about it. So when you have that, <clears throat> when you have governments like the Trudeau government, uh, <clears throat> that uh, frozen bank accounts, when you have at the international <clears throat> level uh, sanctions against a country that you, know, you cannot do any transaction in US dollars, uh, I think that will accelerate the change of the, um, the US dollar being the dominant uh, currency for international exchanges. And uh, that can be a good thing, uh, but um, the way that it's happening may be not so much under control. Uh, and I hope that gold or Bitcoin will have a, a role to play uh, and, and that will be the best. Uh, so, so we'll see what will happen. I'm not an expert in, in gold or bitcoins, but I understand that the fiat money is not the solution. And so uh, these changes will happen at the international scene. Maybe we'll have uh, two or three currencies that will, be, that will dominate uh, international exchanges. And maybe uh, maybe a basket of currency that can be based on gold or based on Bitcoin. I don't know, but uh, a lot of things can happen, and we we must be open to that. And uh, and you know, I'm I'm not there to give any uh, advice, financial advice to uh, Canadians or to anybody. But having gold or Bitcoins in your portfolio, I believe that it uh, it it may be smart to to do that. In, in my book, The Bitcoin Standard, I think the case for Bitcoin uh, very briefly comes down to the fact that it's the hardest money that we have. It's harder even than gold. So the supply growth at a lower is lower than even gold, or it will be in the next couple of years. And that's really what made gold so special. What made gold money is that its supply growth is very uh, slow. But now Bitcoin is going to overtake it. But I think the major advantage that Bitcoin has over gold is that gold requires centralized clearance. So you have to trust in central banks, and you have to trust in the political authorities that control central banks. And so therefore, the gold standard is is essentially a big honeypot because you're putting all of everybody's gold you know you you can't uh, you can't send gold across the world physically from your home to somebody else's home in China when you're buying something from China. You put your gold in your bank and your bank has its reserves in the central bank and your central bank has a um, a line of trade with the Chinese central bank and the Chinese central bank has uh, an account for the person you're buying from, uh, from his bank. And so that entire process is extremely vulnerable to centralized control. That's the problem with gold, and that's why we got out off the gold standard. Uh, Bitcoin fixes this effectively by having the clearance happen in a decentralized way where you can actually effectively hand over your Bitcoin to the person in China without anybody being in the middle, without anybody being able to take over that. And I think this is really where the advantage lies and why I think we um, and why I think it's 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 unlikely to be a future of many um, different currencies. So I think, you know, what, what, um, I'm trying to make the case for here. Why don't you take a more proactive role about uh, Bitcoin? You know, I think it's uh, it's it's economic inevitability, perhaps, but also it's politically a very powerful tool for you to employ it because um, you know the the more political parties in Canada speak about Bitcoin, the more they place it as an agenda, the more you put it out there, the more Canadians hold Bitcoin, the more Canadians become supportive of it, the more Canadians are free from the what we saw happen to the Canadian truckers. Um, if they had the Canadian truckers, you know, had, had most of them already had Bitcoin, they'd have, um, they, they'd have been far less vulnerable to what the government would have done. Um, so do you see yourself maybe adding it as perhaps part of your platform or, or uh, making it legal tender, perhaps? Yeah, you have a point there, you know, uh, the, the, the challenge with uh, Bitcoin right now is that, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, are not using it to do their day-to-day -day transaction. And they're not using it because a lot of people don't know that uh, they, have a, they, they have something else that they can use. 
And the more people that can use it, the better it will be for the, for the currency, the better it will be. So that being said, also, <clears throat> we as a political party, uh, the only position on Bitcoin is to uh, not do anything. Like you just said, you don't want the government to be in charge of that. You, want, you don't want the government to take any control. What I don't like to see right now, it's uh, central banks that try to have a, 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 a current, an electronic currency or something like that, uh, or they want to regulate uh, Bitcoins, and um, you know, uh, they must not. So <clears throat> the government doesn't have a role <coughs> sorry, a role to play. And in our platform, we let that to the free market. Uh, and same thing also about the gold standard. You know, I, I just said historically that it's there. And, you know, I believe, but uh, in Canada, we cannot, uh, we cannot impose a gold standard. It has to be a negotiation with different countries and it will happen. But um, we, we cannot say, okay, here in Canada, we'll have a gold standard. Uh, actually, the Bank of Canada <laughs> doesn't own any, any gold. So, um, and, and, uh, but what I'm doing, you know, I think I participate in the education of Canadians about uh, real currency uh, and against the fiat money. Uh, I think that that's important to do that. But, you know, <laughs> I'm looking forward and um, maybe, yes, maybe we'll have a basket of currencies that will be, <coughs> sorry, that will be backed on the, uh, uh, bitcoins and other with gold and I, I don't know but what I'm saying it's that the, that financial system that we have right now won't be the same one in 10 years or 15 years we are in the middle of a revolution and uh, and people must be ready for that yeah so I mean I I, I, I I'm, I'm I'm a libertarian so I think you know generally governments shouldn't intervene with money at all um, but I guess, uh, I'm, but I also don't. <laughs> I, I also don't think people should run for elections and uh, uh, legitimate the process in general. But I think, what, <laughs> if you are into it, I think it, uh, it it might be worth thinking of it as a kind of defensive um, weapon against this, because I think um, you know you're not to. I, I think if if the PPC grows, um, there is no reason why. Um, Trudeau might not do the same thing that he did to truckers against you. I mean, let's face it, you've uh, broken as much laws as the truckers have broken laws so far. Uh, so if he can do it to truckers, uh, <laughs> he, he can do it to you. Party, as a political cop party, uh, we will uh, accept donation with Bitcoins. I think we're working on that. That will come soon. Uh, so, so that's something that we're looking at. Uh, I think that would be important uh, to, to have that opportunity to receive money from our donors, uh, only Canadian donors. Uh, so, so we are open to that. Uh, but yes, I don't trust the government. And, um, <clears throat> and that's why, you know, we need to find an alternative. And, um, uh, you know, uh, you, you're an expert on, the, on that subject. And, you know, I think you have great points there. Uh, and we need to have that discussion a little bit more in, in our uh, democracy. So if you, if you were to be elected prime minister, what would be your uh, um, central banking policy? What are you going to do with the central bank? Yeah. Uh, first of all, like uh, Ron Paul said, uh, audit the Fed. I believe that we must audit the Bank of Canada. Uh, we must be sure that... Um, the Bank of Canada, we will try to target a zero inflation target instead of two, three percent. Inflation is a hidden tax, like I said. That's with that will limit their power to create uh, money out of thin airs. But that won't be the so the real solution. That's only a first step that we can do when we are elected. Uh, and also, the federal government must uh, cut spending to balance the budget. So if we balance the budget, we won't need to. Uh, to have the Bank of Canada monetize our debts because uh, our deficit, because we won't have any deficit. So I think that would be important. And after that, uh, speaking with our counterparts, speaking with other uh, Western countries, uh, if it's not happening uh, right now, uh, about a new monetary system based on something and not on fiat money.
uh, that will be important. And, and I think it would be something that Canada can start. Uh, maybe if I'm elected prime minister in two years, uh, you know, uh, we can start this conversation. If I'm prime minister in 20 years, maybe that would be done. <laughs> but that being said, we, we need to, to have a new international money system, monetary system. And I want to be part of this discussion. And, and I'm welcoming uh, the solution that you, are, that, that you are arguing for. I think that can be a good solution. Yeah, and I think it might also be worth looking into El Salvador. They've uh, had, uh, they've uh, adopted Bitcoin as a national currency, as a, as a legal tender. And it's, um, you know, uh, a lot of people said this was going to end in tears. Uh, it hasn't been ending in tears yet. So it might be something worth considering as a part of uh, the agenda. Um, Do you have any, any details about that? Uh, because I believe that doing that... Uh, the population must use more uh, bitcoins than they were before. Did, did you have any data or statistic? Uh, I know it's yes. a bit recent. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, um, I don't have the exact numbers, but uh, millions of people in El Salvador downloaded the new wallet, and um, it's it's still uh, it's it's still not used very widely in terms of day to day usage. But a lot more people are aware of it. A lot more people are using it, and I think. Um, but, you know, at this point, you know, I argue in my book, because Bitcoin is such a small part of the global money supply, you know, there's about 90 to $100 trillion of money in the world of national currencies. Bitcoin is around 1% of that. So it's still 1% of people's cash balances. The, the likelihood that you will want to trade with somebody who has a significant Bitcoin balance and is willing to um, change the size of their Bitcoin balance depending on um, buying and selling with you is pretty low at this point, even in a place like El Salvador. Most people just don't hold large quantities. So it's... Uh, it's 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 a slow process. It's not going to happen overnight. People think of it as like upgrading from, say, Windows to Mac. You're just uh, switching from one operating software. You buy a new machine, but it's money. It's more complicated. You have to, you know, you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of revenues and expenditures that are in Bitcoin and obligations that are in uh, in dollars. Let's say. And you can't just overnight flip to holding everything in uh, Bitcoin because you, you're going to need to be exchanging back and forth to meet your obligations and you'll be getting um, paid in this. So it's a gradual process of building up cash balances, which I think over time, because Bitcoin goes up in value because the supply is limited, whereas national currencies decline in value because the supply is unlimited, over time, people's cash balances in Bitcoin increase and then the opportunities for trade increase. But I think an interesting thing is that, you know, if something similar to the truckers protest happened in El Salvador, uh, President of El Salvador, President Bukele, would not be able to do something like um, what uh, uh, Justin Trudeau did because he can't control the Bitcoin network. And I think this is really the, the key idea that it's um, money that allows people in the country to send money to one another and abroad and to get remittances from abroad and to send and receive money from anywhere in the world without needing to go through the government's authority. So it was a, it, it was, it's. Um, it's, it's an astonishing move for a government to make because it's effectively handing over power because it's telling the people, now you have this wallet in your phone and nobody can take away your coins from you. And so I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's a very interesting case to keep track of. Might be worth uh, looking into for the PPC as an agenda item. And I think Bitcoin is quite popular in Canada. Canada's got a pretty significant Bitcoin constituency. Yeah, yeah, I believe it is also. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I know, I know some of my friends that uh, are doing transaction with bitcoins, and uh, they're they're yeah. So, but uh, you have a point there. The next uh, general election in Canada, maybe in two years, we still have the time to look at it and to read your books in details. And uh, uh, we, <clears throat> yeah, I said um, I, I said that I'm for a gold standard because that was what happened in the past, we had more stability and things like that. But uh, <clears throat> now we have a new, uh, a new competition to the gold standard and, uh, and, and we need to look at it. You have a point there. Okay, great. Uh, Daniel, you have a question for uh, Mr. Bernier? Yes, uh, it, it's kind of already been answered. I, I was gonna actually ask you um, 
whether you would accept Bitcoin uh, as donations for your party. And you've already said that. I think it would be an amazing move for you to make. As Safe said, there's already so many great Bitcoiners and great Bitcoin companies in Canada that are have probably not even voted for many years because they're so disillusioned with what's going on. But if they saw a party come out and say, we will accept Bitcoin as donation, and you can have that in your party coffers for the next two to five years, you'll be shocked at what a war chest that that could become. Uh, so th thanks for thanks for giving up your time and, and coming on and speaking to us about this. Uh, but like I said, you'd, you'd kind of already answered uh, my question before. Yeah, about that, I just want to add, we are in discussion with Election Canada. That's the body uh, who regulates uh, us uh, as a political party. And I believe that we may have their approval or not about it. But it's something that actually we want to do uh, as soon as possible. Well, I guess uh, we are coming up to the end of our time. I want to thank you so much for uh, this uh, fascinating conversation. I want to wish you all the best of luck in your attempts to uh, bring some sanity back to Canada. I've uh, spent a lot of time in Canada. I love the place. I love the beef in Canada. It's amazing, delicious beef that you guys have over there. I have a lot of friends and uh, family in Canada as well. And I look forward to going back again. And I uh, hope one day, you know, we'll have a much more sane world with uh, people like you playing a much more significant role in the future of the country. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for educating me on Bitcoins. And thank you for everything. I think you, you have a point there. We need more discussion about it. And uh, I, I really appreciate that opportunity that I had to, to be with you today. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.